Father, we do indeed gather to worship you. Fill this place and this space with your Holy Spirit. Everything we offer you is from our lives, is from our needs, is from our joy, and we offer it to you this morning, Lord. May it be appropriate to you. And in return, we ask you to join us at the table set this morning. Lord, be with every person here from whatever experience they come in the week. Be with us, transform us, open us up, renew us this morning. And we pray this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Welcome. Welcome to Bueller Mennonite Church, whether this is your first time here or whether it's your, I don't know, 50th year, 60th year, 70th year. It's the same old place but God's spirit moves anew in this place. And I expect you, I challenge you to expect that God will touch you in some way this morning. We have tables set this morning. Part of what we're doing this morning, all of what we're doing this morning is setting the table as we prepare for communion uh, together. And uh, if you're wondering if you're welcome to the table, if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are welcome to join us for communion at the end of this service. But see, everything that we do this morning, our welcomes, our songs, our scripture, our proclamation, our presence, our offerings, everything is setting the table to remember what Christ has done for us. In that light, I welcome you to join uh, to stand up and to welcome your neighbor to this place. Greet someone you don't know. Let's remain standing.
Let's remain standing and in your worship books or off the wall, let's, uh, let's sing the song, The Love of God. And as you notice, it's this author's attempt to somehow put into words the immense amount of love that God has for us and why we're here. Uh, let's sing these songs in, in reverence to, to God's love for us. Love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, even if stretched from sky to sky. What powerful words to describe the immensity of God's gifts and love to us. Let's prepare to give back of our monetary gifts to God, and also to remind you that we're looking for other gifts that you might be available to you. Thank you for those of you that responded last Sunday when off the cuff we called for help 
for the Wednesday night meals. Again, if you are interested in helping with your gifts for the outreach ministry on Wednesday night to help with meals, there's a sign-up sheet. There's a menu to help you with that. And also, if you feel like this is an offering you want to give, put your name on a piece of paper again and put it in the offering place as your offering to God this morning. Ushers, come forward. Let's dedicate those gifts to God that we gave. If you're able and you're willing, let's stand one more time and raise our voices in singing Praise God from Whom. it be so. Amen. You may be seated. How would you give further offering of your testimony of God's goodness in some of the joys and uh, uh, praises that you would share? How has God been at work in the world? How have you seen God at work in Bueller or Hutchinson and Kansas in this world? Where would you like God to be more present in your life? Introduce any guests, any announcements you might have as well. Raise your hand. We have a microphone that will come to you and introduce who you are and we'll go from there. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. cleansing power revealing 
How he made the lame to walk again And caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the grave. singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming Scripture this morning is Ephesians 4, chapter 25, verse 25 through 5, verse 2. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Heavenly Father, we have heard your scripture. You speak to us quite plainly. Open my mouth now to speak. Open our ears to hear. And our entire fellowship to respond appropriately. Amen. Some say you'll find people wherever the wind blows. Or as in Kansas, if you're wanting to get rid of your leaves, south wind will blow them one way, but be assured probably in a few hours it'll blow right back past your yard at least. But the opposite is actually somewhat true, mostly true for farmers, <laughs> especially farmers who are spraying their crops. Last week, or the last few weeks, I've spent quite a bit of time on farms, a week in Minnesota and then a week down in California, checking out uh, my father's and my father-in-law's fields and farms. 
And like farmers here, farmers there, both in Minnesota and California, spray their fields. We're not going to have a conversation about chemicals right now, except to make some note about how this works. I even saw an airplane. This didn't happen on this last trip, but a while back in California, we had one pecan tree that we needed spraying. Did we bring in the hand sprayers? No, we called in the aerial sprayer. And wouldn't you know, this guy, by the way, is the pilot for Airwolf movie series, uh, television series. How many of you remember Airwolf? Yeah, we got some. <laughs> he was the pilot for that. But anyways, he came in, he dove it, and then he shot straight up. He turned on his nozzles. The spray just went straight up, whoosh, right on the tree. Spray. That's talent. <laughs> It's a very common question to ask, hey, where will we be spraying tomorrow? And the answer depends on wind, right? Where's the wind? What direction is the wind going to be? Or will it be windy? A farmer will do the south field, maybe, if the wind is just right. Or they'll do the north field, depending on that. Or they'll do the, the middle field if the conditions are such that it might not overspray and hit the corn on one side if they're spraying beans in the middle. A farmer needs a still morning or a still evening to spray the farm because it lays sandwich between maybe even his wife's garden and the flowers of the neighbor. And you have to watch for overspray. If you're planting cotton beside beans, you've got to be extra careful. And so you're constantly aware of overspray, of drift that might happen. And flying over the fields of the Midwest and flying over the fields of California as we got to the Central Valley, as we did this week, you see fields from up high. You see tons of fields, especially the circles when you get out around here and out to the west and into the deserts. You see alfalfa fields, a patchwork of alfalfa fields, of cotton fields, of soybeans, of wheat, of almonds, of carrots, of pomegranates even. That wasn't in Kansas. And it's this patchwork, this beautiful sort of symbiotic patchwork from 30,000 feet in the air, a quilt work of vegetation on the prairies and on the desert. But from ground level, these crops and all of these differences, this diversity of cotton besides soybeans, of pomegranates with the wheat, demand extra care. And they demand extra attention. What looks so beautiful from up top and from the outside, when you get down to it, when the rubber hits the rose, you've got to watch it. Because what helps one farmer's crop can ruin or damage another farmer's crops. Unless you just don't care. Yet sometimes, even with extreme caution when it's used, Rift or drift happens, and the restoration then that needs to happen when that drift happens causes rift to occur. Whether we intended the drift to happen often results in drift, and what helps one farmer's crops may not be beneficial for the crops right next to them. And I believe this is true, and this is very similar to us as a patchwork of people in the church or in our communities or any sort of relationship we find ourselves in. We find ourselves planted in our workplaces. We find ourselves planted in communities and in schools and in churches, even in families, next to people who are so much different from us as almonds are from seed corn. And yet we are called we are placed, whether we like it or not, we are called to, but we are placed, whether we like it or not, beside each other. And what helps one person might not be beneficial to the person beside you, especially if there's some drift that happens, and it might result in rift. From the outside, all looks well, good and well, like a patchwork quilt, but when the rubber hits the road... When the rubber hits the road and we step into our actual fields, whether it's here in these holy walls or in the streets that we have to go out in when we leave this place, into the reality of different personalities and cultures, things get a little bit more real. Complicated. Messy. 
And to deal with this reality, we humans have a tendency to want to run from those realities. We understand there's drift, but to mitigate the drift, instead of being careful, we say, well, that's that person's fault, and so we build higher fences. We erect clearer boundaries. And we're punitive when that rift happens. We have a tendency to sever relationships instead of finding connections when drift comes across. Even when extra care and attention is given to help these different relationships, drift happens, and then this rift happens. It's inevitable in life. It's inevitable as it is with farming. It will happen. So the question is, do we run from it? Do we construct ourselves? Do we somehow try to inoculate ourselves from this? Or do we examine, say, hey, look, that's life, and it's real, and there's got to be a way of dealing with this without breaking connections, with dealing with this drift and this rift so that it doesn't get deeper and worse, while realizing that what is good for one farmer's crop might not be good for neighboring crops. You heard the scripture that Sarah read this morning, Ephesians, about what our job as followers of Christ is in making sure that we mitigate the risk of this drift and for sure the rift that happens afterwards. A chemical, maybe, or a way of interacting that indeed is beneficial to all. We are called to behave in this way in midst of the patchwork reality of our life. Check out what Paul says in the verses before where Sarah read. If you have your Bibles open, Ephesians 2. We started with Ephesians 4. Ephesians 2. Paul is working on this idea of how do we deal with, with, in fact, all of Ephesians has to do with how do we bring together, in his case, the big issue was Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. They were as different as almonds are from cottonseed or from pomegranate seed or from whatever we plant. How do we bring this together under Christ? Is it even possible? And so Paul is working on this. In chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he says this as a reminder of how to start working at this. For by grace, you who have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. Now this is to make sure that us as farmers, we don't think, well, it's my crop. I did it. I pulled myself up by my bootstrap. I'm not just picking on farmers here. I'm talking about all of us. I hope you know I'm speaking metaphorically here. This is to mitigate the idea that lest we think Our position in life is the only way. He is reminding us that all of you have been saved by grace. You might be people. You might have everything down. You might have dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. But he makes a very strong point. He says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not, these are the hardest words probably for a good, humble Mennonite (laughs) who's not prideful of his own things. This is not by your own doing. For many of us, that's a great word of hope right there. It's nothing that we can do that's going to have God love us more or love us less. But I think he's speaking to those of us, especially those of us who have a tendency to say, well, I am the way it should be. If my drift goes over on the farmer's, other farmer's field, that's their fault because I've got it all And I am the center of the universe. And Paul is putting us all back in his place. All the Gentiles and all the Jews back in their place and says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. Not the result of works so that no one may boast. So no one brag. So no one might be too proud or might even be able to say, Here I stand and you guys better belly up the way I told you to do it. Or if I have drift over your field, well, tough luck because I have this figured out. You should be getting out of my way, doing it my way, so that no one may boast. No one may think that they are the center of the universe, that their way is the best way or the highway. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Now jump down to verse 14. He doesn't let this go. I mean, you can read all the stuff in between too. But now, he's speaking to all of us, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He is what keeps the patchwork quilt together. He is what keeps the diversity together. His body, both groups, and again, he's talking to Jews and Gentiles, but I think he's talking to all our divisions and our prideful uh, lining up of of boundaries and walls to keep other people out or to mitigate uh, the the result of drift that that we've put out there. He says... In his body, Christ, both groups into one, has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility of us. Christ has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that Christ might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two or in place of the many, thereby making peace. And we Mennonites, if you ever want to know why we are rooted in peace and reconciliation, this is one of our central texts. Why Christ did it for us, and he calls us to do the same. He abolished the dividing wall, making one place of two, thereby making peace and reconciling both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were once far off and peace to those who are near. For through Christ, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. Think about that as you're eating the bread and drinking the cup this morning. Think about that as you see your neighbor. Think about that as you see your enemy. Think about that as you decide what sort of chemicals you're going to spray out into the world. We are tied together in one body. We are then to be the same as Christ. And that's what Sarah's passage from starting in chapter 4, the one that's listed in her Bibles, that's what that is then telling us to do or how to do it. These passages are here to show us how to minimize our rift and our drift so that when we truly gather around a table and we use all this highfalutin words about communion and love and God and joy and happiness, that it actually is true. That if someone sitting on the outside sees that and he says, no, wait a minute. Preacher said that all these people are in ecstasy over all these fancy words and yet when they step outside these boundaries, it doesn't match up. This isn't a way for us to come here and, 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 and get forgiven. It's a way for us to show the world this is who we are, to put into practice, to say this is what God was to us, this is what we are to the world. If it doesn't match up, we shouldn't be eating at this table. And that's what Paul is driving home. And that is what Paul is trying to tell us when we think about the drift and the rift that we have in our own lives because God cares for our neighbors, because God cares for our enemies, we care for our neighbors and our enemies. Because God once loved us, even while we were yet sinners, as Romans says, we are called to love those even before, even before they have made it right in our mind. It's not just a matter of my crops being taken care of and who cares of how it affects my neighbors. God is calling all of us to be aware of our rift and our drift. And that's what I'm calling our attention to as we prepare ourselves for this eating and this drinking together and as it sends us out into the world. Because remember, sometimes what isn't beneficial for one farmer's crop or is beneficial for one farmer's crop isn't for others. And so how are we going to know what that is in our community without entering those situations and dealing with those situations? I came across some blunt, blunt words from author Phillips Brooks. He was a preacher and a writer around, I think, the turn of the the 19th century or the beginning of of the 20th century. And he talks about drift and rift in people's lives this way. 
And I think he talks to us as we get ready to come to the table. He says, you who are letting miserable understandings run from year to year, meaning to clear them up someday, you who are keeping wretched quarrels alive because you cannot quite make up your minds that now is the day to sacrifice your pride and kill them, you who are letting your neighbors starve until you hear that he is dying of starvation, or letting your friend's heart ache for a word of appreciation or sympathy which mean, you mean to give to him or her someday, if you could only know and see and feel all of a sudden that time is short, how it would break that spell. How you would go instantly and do the thing that you might never have another chance to do in the midst of our drift and our rift. Paul, in today's passage, backs this up in verse 26. He says, after he talks about speaking truth to each other, he then says, be angry. That's going to happen. Be angry, but in your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let time pass on your anger and let it molder and smolder and grow big and let you demonize the other person. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil in your anger. Wow. Further down the line, Ephesians 5.15, he says, Be careful how you then live, not as unwise people, but as wise people, making the most of your time. How we spray the chemicals in our lives is important. When I do premarital counseling, I find it a fundamental point to work on the idea that When you marry someone, you're not just marrying the other person. I think a lot of times, especially when we're deeply in love, when we're first married, I just, that person, I I don't even see any faults in that person. I am just, it's just he and me, or she and me. And one of the realizations and one of the realities is when you marry someone, when you are in a relationship, you bring along all the other relationships. Marriage isn't just a one-on-one, it's a mobile. You are bringing two mobiles dynamic of balances and pushes and, and di- uh, uh, traits and, and all these sort of things, and you're bringing them all together as one family system. The man has his family system, the woman has his family system, and you bring them together, and it gets messy. It gets messy. As much as we'd like to think it's just me and that other person, it's not. It's not. You are marrying a family system. And when you establish a new home, When you bring together different families, and this can be for any sort of relationship in your life, when you you do this, you bring in these different life experiences, whether you want to or not. And one of the ways you can strengthen your marriage or you can strengthen these sort of relationships is to remember that much of our personal preferences are not about one side being fundamentally wrong or the other side being fundamentally wrong, but in fact, it might just simply be different. Now, lest you all think, well, that doesn't apply to life, or we had it all going, we're still so madly in love, none of these differences make a difference, well, come see the preacher, we have some counseling to do. But I can guarantee you this, when Hannah and I first got married, sorry Hannah, I tell the story, I think it's pretty innocuous, hopefully there won't be any drift and rift later. (laughs) Um... We had this, we were first year of marriage, you know. We had studied all of this, you know, family system stuff. We got into an argument. We actually got into an argument over what? Well, we were doing dishes together. That was a good thing. But I knew fundamentally that in the universe, you have your dirty dishes over here, you wash them in this basin, and then you move, you keep on always moving to the, to the right, that is the right, yeah. And then you rinse them here, and then you dry them right over here. Anna, on the other end, absolutely knew the universe ran the opposite way. Dirty dishes. Wash them here, rinse them here, and then you dry them here. And that didn't even, that didn't, didn't even begin the argument about whether you rinse them in cold water or hot water. <laughs> but we were absolutely convinced that was the right way. The assumption was, how in the world do you not know better? What was wrong with your parents? for not raising you, right? And believe it or not, it turned into a fight. Now, granted, we probably kitchen-sinked, pardon the pun, 
a whole bunch of other issues into it, but isn't that life when you're doing business? Isn't that life when your teacher beside you really annoys you for whatever reason? We make assumptions. We assume that our absolute truth, without understanding who that other person is, is the way to go. And we are willing to spray chemicals all over that because on our field it works. It always has worked. But we stop to say, well, what are the needs from the other side? Is it really this issue? Is it really a matter of being fundamentally wrong or fundamentally right? Have we stopped and talked about where the difference lies in this? I offer this to you because we live in a culture that is absolutely primed and ready to spray burn down on anybody who disagrees with us. If you can say, well, they are totally different and you can demonize them, you can also kill them. You can also shut them out. You can throw them away as wasted. And yet Paul warns us. Paul warns us and says, hey people, you were once that. You were once in terrible disagreement with God, and yet through his grace, you have been brought into one. Make sure before you spray, in fact, he doesn't really even give us the option to spray over everything. Make sure that you are in killing off the people next to you. Right or wrong, in the church and historically, has often not been so much in the positions we take, but in how we have interacted with each other. Because we have brought different views to the situation. And that's a hard idea that is hard to accept especially when that other person is so wrong, so wrong. But like God did for us, we are invited to the table. We are invited to understand that there is so much that it can be extended over so many scenarios and that we can say in many situations, that's not how I do it but I will see how you do it. And let's live together at this table. Chemical drift can destroy crops. The drift of misunderstanding and the drift of, of applying everything to anything to want to kill off those that are wrong destroys relationships. There's no better time. There's no better time than today to do what we might not have another chance to do as we come to the table. Let's make right. Let's make right in all our drifts and our rifts. And may it be, as Paul then says in Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Just as God in Christ has forgiven you, forgive others. And then be imitators of God. What does that mean? Be imitators of God. God loved you while you were yet a sinner. Be imitators of God and live in love as Christ loved us. He gave himself up for us. He died for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. Let's sing... Uh, Help us to help each other, Lord. Number 362, we can remain seated as we prepare ourselves to go deeper and closer to the table.
The table is set. We just need participants. But before we do, it's important to know why it is we celebrate what we call communion in the Mennonite Church. Other places call it the Lord's Supper. Other places, the Eucharist. And for us, it is a remembrance. It's a remembering. There's nothing special of the bread or the cup, but there is something special when you join at a table, around a table with friends and family. I don't have to tell you the Bible stories of when people gathered in hospitality and God was revealed. There are many of them in the Bible, and that's why we do it. And it's a way of remembering. Remember we talk about how God is constantly getting us to try to remember his work, his work that we just talked about, loving, bringing, reconciling together. So for us, it's remembering, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sin of this world. It's an encounter. It's an encounter with a risen Lord. Remember the two disciples that went and they were confused and didn't know what life was bringing them and it was tough, and yet when they ate together with Jesus, the Bible has the same words, taking, breaking, blessing, and giving, same words that we use in communion in that moment, and their eyes were opened. An encounter with the risen Lord, a live Lord, not something just relegated to the past. It's a feeding on Christ in our faith, asking God, we're not perfect, but we need your help, and this is our way of gathering together to do it. And it's a communion of one body, people, a patchwork, gathering together at the same table, together eating. Nowhere is communion a single act. Its word itself is based on the word fellowship, based on the word koinonia, which means together, as God is together with us. And, finally, it's an anticipation of what is shown in Revelation, that great banquet table. It's a sign of hope. It's an already, but not yet. The fact that in the presence of my enemies, the Lord prepares a table before me, and that my cup, it overflows. As we prepare to look for, no matter how, what this world does, God has a great banquet table with all the saints gathered around it to eat and to celebrate. And that's what we're doing when we gather around these tables. This is the Lord's table. And as I mentioned before, all of you who profess and confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you're welcome to come take part in it this morning. But before we do that, I want us to be prepared I want us to prepare. It used to be in our tradition we had a whole week of preparation before. Deacons, preachers would come to everybody's house and make sure that we were ready to take the cup. We don't do that. We count on the fact that you have your own will and that you come prepared to this table. We want to have a moment where we lift up some of these things to God before we, uh, we come to the table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer some words of prayer that direct the thoughts and the areas in our life that maybe need some cleaning up. And in that moment of silence, in that moment of silence, it's between you and God to clear that up and to lift that up to God. So I will allow silence, and then I will go on to the next area. And in the end, we're going to end with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to use the words... uh, Uh, sin and sins as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. So, come before God in anticipation of, of eating. God, before we take the body of the Lord, before we share his life represented in the bread and the wine, we recognize the sorry things that are within us. And these things we lay down before you. We recognize the words of hope that we often fail to give, the prayers of kindness buried in our pride, the actions of care that we argued out of sight. Lord, these things we lay down before you.
Lord, the narrowness of vision and of mind, the need for other people to serve our personal wills, and every word and silence meant to hurt. Lord, we lay these things before you. Lord, of those around us in whom we meet you, we ask their pardon and we grant them ours. Lord, we lay down before you every contradiction to Christ's peace and grace and love that we have willingly and knowingly made. Lord Jesus Christ, you the reason for this, this meal. We empty our hearts, we stretch out our hands, and we ask that you meet each one of us here in the bread and in the cup as we remember you and as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today your daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear these words from Jesus in John 14. He says, Peace. Peace I leave with you. Why would you leave something behind if it wasn't supposed to be there for a while and it was meant to be at the center of our lives? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And Romans 14:7 says, Welcome one another just as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God invite you to do what it takes to turn to your neighbor and say, I wish you the peace of Christ. Pass on that peace that Christ has given you. Paul in the midst of intense conflict in the church at Corinth, lays down the law. He lays down the law and he offers these directions for how, uh, how we should do the Lord's Supper and why we should do the Lord's Supper. And in their case, you had people that came uh, early. The rich people brought a lot of food and didn't share it with the poor people. The poor people couldn't come and so they felt left out. And there was disunity and yet they still very piously held to doing the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, come on now, people. Is that really what it's about? I'll let you read that part. But then he goes on and he says this. And he says, this are the, these are the words and the meaning of the Lord's Supper. He says, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And he, when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, what we're doing, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. We are going to take communion in a way that uh, we, I haven't led here before, but we have three tables. We have a table here, a table here, and a table that's been moved. <laughs> it's back there. <laughs> we'll move it back to the center. We'll open those doors so there's a bit more room, and a table back there. And what we would like to do as the music begins to play is groups of 10, 
Now, we don't have to be so legalistic because we are living under grace. If there are 11 or 12 at the group, you can come forward. But we're going to make groups around these tables. The deacons will serve you. You'll take first the bread, and you'll eat the bread together, and then you'll take the cup. And then I want you to greet your, the people that you, t- that you ate with with a holy kiss or with a hug or a shake. And you can go back. And then the next group comes. So it'll flow. Some groups will take longer than others, but let it flow. And uh, it, it will happen as you come to the table to partake in this. Um, so in back, up front, are two. If the balcony would come down first to do the back, that would, that would help us out. I'm going to invite the deacons forward. And if there are those of you who cannot come forward, there is a deacon that will serve you in your spot as well. So just raise your hand as well. And as the deacons come forward, I want to just give a blessing to, these, uh, to our hosts up here. And then, uh, and then I'm going to invite you to come forward. To come forward, to remember, to celebrate, to be with each other in the presence of Christ. Dear Jesus, you are our bread of life. You are our fruitful vine. You feed our bodies with the gifts of the earth. You delight in our souls with abundant grace. You nourish our spirits with eternal love. And so we gather around these tables to remember your great salvation. Lord, we pray that you make this more than just bread and and a cup. Make this a memory that becomes our life. Strengthen our desire to be in your presence. Deepen our trust in your goodness. Renew our hope in your grace, that you are the source of our life, and we depend on your mercy. Lord, be at this table with us. Amen. Come. Come and taste and see that God is good.